billahi minash shaitani rajim bismillahirrahmanirrahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin salatu wassalamu ala asyrafi anbiya mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain thank you dr sulaiman for the uh, for the introduction and uh, my esteemed colleague dr wan sohaimi i have a very big responsibility i'm supposed to speak about something which is i don't know i mean i think somebody did you you've seen the video about happiness of somebody did a study on tech talks that it was a lot i put a, a very long study and they found out happiness is of a certain kind so for me to crunch this thing about happiness in islam in uh, like 40 minutes that will be a bit presumptuous <laughs> so what i will do is i will give you some of the key points uh, that i have derived from the book the meaning and experience uh, of happiness in islam uh, that was written by professor said naqib al atas and um, and compare some of the major points uh, that was made by Prasala Tas with uh, Imam Haddad and uh, the key point here is that i want to say there is not only continuity of ideas and thought and practices but also similarities to which the content doesn't change and this is something very important to compare the muslim experience of happiness with that of other civilizations right so i have to move about because it's in my slides and uh, i can't read the slide from here so i have to see from here these are the two main references um, the original monograph is this one it was written uh, i remember it was written when we were at istak and i asked professor latas why he wanted to elaborate on happiness and for many of you who have read his work on islam and secularism you'll find the word happiness in one of the pages and he said he stopped there without further elaborating it so he wanted to elaborate it so this uh, became this monograph and i translated it into this um it was an act of full hardy in a sense thinking that translation is a easy work i started in 1997 the same year i finished my dissertation my defense only to have the book in this form in 2002 so 5 years to translate a small piece of work as i say it is a piece of work it's not easy happiness uh, this is what professor lata says it's not a physical entity and it's not about our emotions it's not the animal soul per se now this is something that will going to be having a little bit of difficulty because he Professor Latas comes from a tradition that is very very long and that tradition now is forgotten. That tradition now is forgotten. In fact there are Muslim scholars and Muslim psychologists now who are completely forgotten of this whole tradition. The tradition that talks about the animal soul, the rational soul and finally the human soul which is the rational soul that is rational and and uh, the cogitative, the cognitive aspect. So you have animal, you have Uh, you have sorry vegetal the animal and finally the rational soul which is not only rational but also cogitative or cognitive and that part is missing the part i'll show you this, the, the the diagram later on happiness refers to peace and security and this peace and security is not only the external but the one which is internal now this is something which is missing in many of uh, well even some muslims today and you can see this in the endemic uh, problem that we see psychological mental problems and uh, this is something that i think we need to explore further because the the works of uh, muslim scholars in the past that talks about happiness is not only limited to the sufis but also the philosophers and there's so many of them in our class at uh, kasis we read the work of ibn baja we read the works of arrazi we read the works of ibn sina and of course the work of al ghazali with the interpretation of sayyid naqib al atas this is the fascinating part because professor atas in his work uh, he says that he reverberates and he rejuvenates the ideas of ghazali in his work so you see the con- continuity so it's fascinating that some of the main key points about happiness or the elements and practices that lead to happiness in islam is in agreement with uh, imam haddad and this is fascinating So there's something called abiding happiness because the uh, the physical that is emotional that is what Professor Lata would say transient happiness transitory it is moment to moment and you can see this like for example you get a present you feel happy somebody give you 
something, you know, a piece of cake, you're happy. That is emotional. That is at the tip of the tongue. That is at the level of sensory. But the happiness is, as it is transitory, it comes and goes. But what is it that is abiding? There is something that is called a vi- abiding happiness. And it has to do with this part. Certainty. Yaqeen. And I think that our great ulama in the past, and this is the bedrock of our, our aqidah, that has to do with yaqeen. So happiness has to do with yaqeen. With yaqeen. And yaqeen has to do with knowledge. And this is why later on, Professor Latas, and here he mentions, that knowledge cannot be without its manifestation. And that has to be in action. The, the amal. By the way, this uh, quotation is taken from his most recent book. It's called Justice and the Nature of Man. It's a blue book, it's a very interesting book to read. So what is certainty? It is a permanent state of consciousness, natural to what is permanent in man. What is permanent in us? Because you see, this is fascinating because you can only get abiding happiness when you have something lodged in something that is abiding in you. And that is your nafs. That is your akal. That is your roh and that is your qalb. The four faculties or the four manifestations, the four aspects that are mentioned uh, many times in the work of Prophet Salata. So each of these manifestations of the faculties of the human soul must be given its due rights in order for it to attain what is called abiding happiness. Because there is the nafsu aspect that you have to attend to, that is the intellectual aspect. Imagine, for example, you are emotionally happy, but mentally you are devoid of a certain level of of, uh, analytical thought. One of the things that is difficult for a human being is when he has lost his faculty of mind. You may be happy in a different state, but not a complete man. See? So, the same thing spiritually. And this is what we can see in the Western world today. They are devoid of spiritual dimensions of their life that you can see. They can be intellectually advanced. They can be, how do you say, in terms of the hedonistic pleasures. They are very good at it. I mean, you can find all kinds of desserts. Every day they keep on cooking up new things. But something is still missing in their life. So happiness relates not only to this worldly life, but also something that is in the hereafter. Because that is more abiding. Khairun wa abqa. That is the one. And therefore, you must keep yourself within the purview of the worldview of Islam. You must have this whole vista of life properly made. And I think this is what Professor Latas, we've been saying all the while at Cassis, uh, that he is an architectonic uh, thinker, a philosopher, an intellectual, but far more higher, he is a Muslim metaphysician. Because he built a system for us to to put our intellectual thought under. This is very important to have a worldview. And the book, uh, The Prolegomena to the Metaphysical Islam, is, is a very good introduction to that. And therefore, uh, this worldview, you must get it through the ilm and the ma'rifah. And Professor Latas, in his Islam and Secularism, he talks about the difference between ilm and ma'rifah, and he also talks about it in here. So it is very concise. Uh, but you do need to give it a bit of contemplation for you to understand his works. All right? Happiness has to do something which is that which is abiding in man. And this is Professor Lata's um, diagrammatic representation from the book Islam and Secularism, what is basically man. There is the inner, there is the outer. The inner is the ruh, nafs, the aql and qalb, and the outer, the faculties and the senses. Most of us are happy at the level of faculties of the senses. Most of us. The hearing, they call it, you know, halawatul <laughs> uzn. And then there is, uh, you know, the, the, the sweetness of the... Uh, you, you hear good songs, you, hear, you taste good food, you have good company. But happiness itself within you. And that is something in you. And that is why he says earlier that you need this element of knowledge and ma'rifah, therefore Professor Latas developed this idea that you must look at yourself within this context. You have fardu'ayn and fardu'kifaya. And later on, 
in his book, Islam and Secularism, based on this diagram, he developed the idea of the Islamic University. So, you see, it is from an individual to the whole bigger community that you must develop this whole idea of happiness based on ilm and ma'rifah. This is what I was referring to earlier. You have the vegetative. Many of us seek pleasure at this level, just eating and growing and be produced. That is your level of happiness. I want good food, I want good house, and I want a good spouse. That's it. So you go using your animal soul and using this actuator movement or whatever to drive yourself away. And the, the drive for that is basically the appetitive part. And that is what you say you are happy, you've gotten a better, a better car, you've got a better house, you've got a better you know, food or whatever. In actual fact, you are serving the animal soul. Are you happy? Well, look at the Quran, you become like Balhum Adal. You're below an animal, basically. This part, I think, is the missing part. And remember, for many of us who are associated, I'm sorry to give a little bit of uh, critical evaluation, Many of us who are in tariqah, we think that our tazkiyah to nafs is at this level, right? And therefore, in order to cleanse yourself at this level, you try to mitigate it at this level. But ikhwana, this part you're missing. You are not making yourself a whole. And this is why our great ulama in the past, even the Sufis, you see that they're writing, some of them are higher level ones. And this is the one that I'm missing today, this dimension. And Professor Atas likes to, I think, complement that with his work. And that's why he's been thinking and, and devoting his life on the works at the higher level. And this is complemented with the works of uh, Imam Haddad, provided you understand the, the implications of what he said. The, he may be saying at the literal level something that we may understand at a very public level, but the connotation of it is very high. And I can show you just a little bit later on. This is a little, well, I would not read the biography, and this is a selection of the works. I would like to thank Sayyid Mayuddin uh, Alatas for giving me this, this selection of books so that I can do a little bit of reading for the presentation today. Um, Sheikh Haddad lived in the 17th century, almost the same time of uh, Nuruddin Raniri at this part of the world. And uh, I, I, my, my, my PhD was on the works by uh, Sheikh Raniri, and the discussion there was very high. For example, the text was La Ta'ifu Asra Li Ahli Lahil Atiyar, and it's a book on metaphysical doctrines of the Sufis. And only at the end of it, it talks about the practical aspects of Tawbah, Shukur, Rida, Zuhud, and what have you. To show to you that the ilm, the ma'rifah, together with the Tazkiyatun Nafs, goes together. And we must not miss, as I said, the higher part of the human rational and the cognitive aspect of our happiness. So therefore, intellectual work is not only, how do you say, burdensome for some, uh, but in actual fact, for, some, for many great scholars in the past, intellectual works are basically something that makes them happy. Uh, to give you an example, um, it said that, you know, great scholars, they don't eat so much, they, they economize on their food. So the person who wrote the story of civilization, Will Durand, uh, his lunch was, uh, was just peanuts and bananas. So compared to us, our lunch would be a nice plate full of biryani and mandi. <laughs> uh, so knowledge that happiness depends on the occurrence or the nearness. This is something that he says, it's very interesting. The idea of nearness, and this is something that is later on discussed by many great uh, ulama of the South, they talk about qurb or ma'iyyatullah. But how are you near to God? Is it by your senses, the physical, the touch, the, the, the sight, the smell? No. Your nearness, your nearness to God, your qurb is by your soul. And there is something there that Professor Latas discusses about the qalb, which is the spiritual organ for spiritual cognition. That is the key. That is the tool that will allow you to be near to God. That is the key, that, that is the, the locus of reception of ma'arifah. And uh, according to Raniri, 
uh, and also uh, Junaid al-Baghdadi. And this is the note that I made, a footnote I made to the commentary on the meaning of happiness in Islam. Uh, the hadith uh, that was associated to this event, it is said, awwalu din ma'rifatullah. Huh? The very first thing about religion is the knowledge of God. But where is this knowledge of God? Some interpret it to mean, well, you must know religion, then only you know your religion. You must know, meaning go through classes about religion. But it actually means referring to the state that Junaid al-Baghdadi talks about on the day of Alastu. Because that is the very first day, the very first moment that we get to know Allah Ta'ala. And that is why it is abiding. It is imprinted on our soul. This recognition of Ma Rabbuka, <laughs> which is the closing question of our external existence. But it was also the beginning question, you know, Alastu Birobikun, Kalu Bala Shahidna. So the beginning was Alastu Birobikum. That was the beginning of our consciousness. And Junaid Baghdadi talks about this. So that is the very first instant of Awaluddin Ma'rifatullah. That is the very beginning. So when you close down your existential condition in this particular earth, the question was, Ma Rabbuka. <laughs> you begin and you end with the same question. So this is very interesting. This is why all these things are reverberated. See, uh, Imam Haddad talks again about certainty. It's power. It's firmness. Stability of faith. Quwatul Iman. So great that it becomes a towering mountain which no conjectures, shak, and illusion rock. Uh, we who are students of Professor Latas, he always talks about shak and dhan, and he talks about happiness, yaqeen. So it is right there in the script, somehow uh, imprinted in the souls of great ulama, that they are continuing the same tradition with the same vocabulary. And this is what Professor Latas was talking about, Islamization of language and understanding, because you need key terms. And these key terms will keep on reverberating regardless of time and space. Because great alim will carry the same torch. And this is what they refer to as, you know, carrying the beaker of, of the Prophet Sallallahu You drink, you drink knowledge, basically. Oxford Dictionary defines, well, for us, when we look at the Oxford Dictionary for Western understanding, good fortune or luck. Because something happens, oh, so you're happy. And this is, what, this is what we mean by transitory, moment to moment, right? And then it's a state of pleasurable content of mind. You know, intellectually you are happy. Uh, a scientist discovered a formula, yes. But it is a discovery of something outside. But he himself is not settled. Many, many, many mathematicians ended up killing themselves. Many Western philosophers of existential uh, uh, how do you say, existential philosophy decided to kill themselves too. <laughs> Somehow they say, you know, once you're up there, there's nothing else to look down under. So you jump. I don't know. Successful or felicitous aptitude, fitness to build a stability, a suitability or appropriateness and felicity. These are all something which is external. So it is about getting to the happiness. This is what the definitions are. But what it is as far as the meaning of happiness, are you in a state of happiness? That is not there. Because it has to do with certainty. So therefore, there is no relation between happiness and iman. There's no relation of happiness with certainty and what more of virtues. Because uh, virtues is something that was discussed in the Greeks, uh, among the Greeks and later on taken up by even the Western world and they have a problem with that. Because in a, in a capitalist, capitalistic world and laissez faire, why do you need to be good? All you need is to be, what do you care? There, there is a book that is famously known as, I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay. But God may not be okay with it. The opposite to happiness, Professor Latas makes a point in his work, uh, and this is also in line with the great traditions of Muslim that if you want to know Iman, you must know Kufur. It does not mean that you have to abide or follow Kufur, but you must know the boundaries. So he also talks about Shaqawa, uh, which is misery. And the misery is the state of being of someone who goes through what is called tragedy. 
right? And a whole discussion of that in the book. Um, what is tragedy? It involves fear, sadness, pain in the soul of the mind. There is pain in the mind. I don't know whether some of us has suffered this or not, but there are some people who suffer pain in the mind that you cannot come to a conclusion in your thought. You cannot see something clearly. Well, the best example I can give for many of us who have gone through pain in the mind, when you want to go through exams during your study days, you could see, you say, man, I cannot figure this thing out. It, you know, it bugs me. And that's a kind of, uh, for some people, they thrive on that kind of pain, like, you know, scholars and intellectuals. But, so it involves um, inability to think deeply, which raises doubt and vacillation. A lot, a lot. Even Muslims are not spared from this now, that we suffer from this shak and don. Vacillation. You're not certain. And you have cases where, you know, some people make wudu and whether my wudu is, you know, fitting, you know, fit all the necessary requirements. Oh, I have to repeat it again. And some people, you know, even the salah, two, three or four times, Allah, Allah, Allah. And you ask, why? I have shak. It's a terrible thing. Shakawa, according to Sayyidina Qibalatas, is the feeling of those who rejected God and upon their resurrection realized how they are at loss. That is the real shakawa. So you have elements of shakawa here manifested at the sensory perception level, like you have pain and things like that, but psychologically you suffer that too. But the, the abiding shakawa is in the day of Jal. It is further aggravated by the constriction of the heart, a fear, a fear of impending disaster. And this one is very interesting, you know. Uh, he was describing, I remember when he was explaining this, it's like, you know, uh, I have been through a car accident. When you, at that very moment, about to hit something, the world suddenly becomes silent, and your time relation is completely different. It's just the whole world slowed down. You don't hear anything. And then, kaboom. It's an after effect of the life. The same thing that you will feel, will you, oops, sorry, you will feel in this. There is a moment of, uh, in a sense of silence, and then you feel you are alone, you cannot do anything, and suddenly the thing hits you. So he was saying this is just the case of those who deny the day of judgment, who deny life after death. You have... You fear death because you do not know what's going on, what's going to take place on the other side, so to speak. So many of us would somehow feign ignorance and say, well, we don't know. So we fool ourselves by saying, what you do not know will not hurt you. Well, not in this case. This is why the purpose of revelation. Um, in his... Uh, Observation in the book, he quoted this statement by a poem by Omar Khayyam that was translated by Edward Fitzgerald. And Professor Latas, in the book Meaning and Happiness of uh, Meaning and Experience of Happiness in Islam, says that this translation of Edward Fitzgerald of Omar Khayyam is basically translating uh, the feeling of a Western man. And if you read this clearly, it's very nice. Oh, you. Uh, well, thou, O thou, who men of baser earth this make, you make men of earth, which is very base. This is talking to God. So, O oh, you, see, very arrogant. And even in paradise, devise the snake. So you see, you made everything. Dala, you bought manusia. You created man from a very low thing, and now you throw a snake in him, at him, try to uh, seduce him, and then for all the sins wherewith the face of man is blackened. And because of the sin, man is black. Oh, man's forgiveness, give. Oh, you give man's forgiveness. And, and take. Man said to God, take forgiveness from me too. This is a huwa ma'ana. It's a very arrogant statement. This is the spirit of the Western man that Prophet is saying. And that's why they're very defiant. And you look, the next one, and this is very interesting. I was watching, uh, because I, wanna, I like the, 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 the series Inspector Morse uh, when I was in Oxford. And one of, the, uh, one of the episodes, he was about to die. 
and he was quoting Alfred Lord Tennyson, a very long poem about Ulysses. And Ulysses is very interesting. Ulysses is not only Tennyson's work that is dated 1892, but there is a recurrent theme coming all the way from Homer. Because Ulysses is another name uh, or another personification of Odysseus. And then later on, well, you read Greek tragedy and you understand what it is. It, the same theme is reverberated in Dante's uh, divine comedy. And look at what he is saying. That which we are, we are. That which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts. You see, the concept of hero is only Greek. And, 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 and the concept of hero, Professor Latas explained in this, uh, in this book, that a man born of noble birth, but then because of a certain fault, he made this tragic error. So this is of heroic hearts. Make weak by time and faith. And this is why, you see, the Western men hate the word faith. And in, in Professor Lata's uh, cons uh, discussion about secularism, it talks about the defatalization of history in order to make man open that the world is his to conquer. This is the spirit of the Greek tragedy. And this is the spirit of the Western man. And this is the spirit of many of us who invite Western worldview. To, but strong in will. That's why they talk about freedom of will, you know, free will. Freedom of will, so it becomes free will. You need the will to work, otherwise, you know, it's fate. You see, they are not happy. And this is where Professor Latas in classes, he talks about this, he mentions about the myth of Sisyphus, you know, rolling up the rocks, up the hill, and then rolls down, and then go up again, because that's, that's how it is, because you have no ending. But strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, but not to yield. Never, never to surrender. So, well, the highest achievement of happiness, according to Aristotle in the Eudemian Ethics, is only an intellectual activity. <laughs> and this is why Professor Lata's work earlier, you know, he mentioned earlier, it has something to do also with the mind. Because this is the problem of existentialist philosophers. Uh, for example, Descartes started out by saying, uh, I think, therefore I am, because he was wondering whether what goes on in the mind is it a dream. And therefore you have a problem of language and reality. Am I touching the real world? And you have people like A.J. Ayer, language, reality and thought. Are these things connected to my mind in the real sense or are these just dreaming? And therefore, I think, therefore I am. That's it. But Professor Latas concludes, and I think this is the basis of all Muslims uh, believe, is Ru'yatullah fil Akhirah. It could only be attained by those who in this life has lived it, fulfilling all the requirements of the Sharia. This is very important. Sufis do not kick out Sharia out of the window. You must follow the Sharia. Even Raniri in his work in Lata'if al Asrar li Ahli Lahil Atiyar, he says, Al Halaj was rightly executed because he goes against the Sharia. The Sharia is what is applied to everyone. So you cannot make exemptions to you, even though you are a high-achieving Sufi. You cannot go out breaking the rules. All right? And then, requirements of the Sharia, you must have this thing called virtue, Fada'il, Sifat Sifat Mahmuda. And they are the Batin ones, and they are the Zahir ones. What are the Zahir ones? It's the religious obligations that you have to perform. The basic ones and also the other not so basic ones. And then you have the internal. The internal one is the missing part. As I said, for, for so many of us in the tariqah, we might think that it's just tazkiyat to nafs at the level of trying to contain the animal soul. But here, look, activities of the heart, the qal, not the nafs al haywaniya the qal. Based on ma'rifatullah and the knowledge of oneself, one must be true to oneself to control the incitations of the lower self with the powers of the one's intellect, namely to control the desires of the animal soul with the powers of the rational through muraqaba and muhasaba. It's a constant practice. 
And this is an example, you have tafakur. This all reverberated in the works of continued and explained in the works of Imam Haddad. And you can read what taf uh, tafakur is uh, fascinating here. Professor Latas talks about all these things in his work, but I'm, I'm not going to go into detail. This is Haddad's meaning of uh, tafakur. You can see it's in uh, Risala Mu'awana, it's page uh, 41, I believe. It will lead to patience, and this is what it is. It leads to shukur. It's very interesting, this idea of shukur, because I, I constantly think about shukur whenever the verse, or with the verse, La in shakartum la azid al nakum, la in kafartum in na la shadid. So if you perform this something or you live by shukur, you see, shukur is not something verbal. Because some people say, but just by tahmeed is good enough to be shukur. No, you can do it by many other means of shukur. By giving what you have. By giving what you have is a physical act of shukur, which not many of us do. <laughs> you are afraid of giving because you're afraid of losing something. Listen, we by nature are given something, were given something, because by nature, therefore, because you are a gift, your act of being is actually giving. I hope you understand that. You are a gift, therefore your nature is giving. You cannot hoard stuff. It is wrong. Raja, khauf, and tawakkul. This is the last part, which is very fascinating. The tawakkul aspect is only in the Muslim culture. Meaning, after everything that you do, you leave the decision to Allah and the kindness of the Prophet's intercession. That's it, you know? Uh, there's, I always listen to this uh, nasheed, you know, Anta ba'dullahi mu'tamadi. Ya Rasulullah, Anta ba'dullahi mu'tamadi. Rasulullah, after the Prophet, you are our bedrock that we fall on. You know, we can stand on you. That's it. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I think that's uh, as much as I want to talk today in just a short span of time. Wa billahi tawfiq wal hidayah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.